A few weeks back, we did a video on how America losing Europe's arms market would come at a staggering cost to American society, jobs, and taxes. It reached close to 500,000 views in a very short time, and in the comments and emails we've had since then, many of you have asked me to do a follow-up based on the areas of equipment that we didn't cover the last time. As always, your wish is my command. As we discussed last time, the US exported a substantial amount of weapon systems to Europe since the fall of the Soviet Union, where many more European nations looked to the US for equipment. However, now that Trump is threatening close NATO allies, he's driving a wedge into the likely future income of the military-industrial complex in the US and putting 2.2 million US jobs at risk. We ended last video on tanks, where Europe has several credible alternatives, likely most visibly illustrated with the French-German next generation Leopard and Leclerc hybrid. It's only natural that the next part of this series starts off at what has proven to be the most important armored capability in the Ukraine war, infantry fighting vehicles. The US has long relied on the very capable Bradley, but sales never really got off the ground anywhere but Lebanon, Saudi Arabia and Croatia. The 300 plus donated to Ukraine have given the vehicle a renaissance and proven that this platform is still capable and relevant. The issue for the Bradley and American IFVs in general is that Europe hands down produces both more capable and more advanced systems. Two European companies are in the process of competing for making America's next IFV. But with the way Donald Trump is threatening Europe, this could quickly come to an end. Seeing that this video is focused on European variants that automatically disqualifies the UK's Ajax and the Spanish-Austrian Ascot II as both of these systems are produced and have ITAR connections to the US military industry through General Dynamics. Now, considering that it is a crime punishable by public shaming in Finland to brag about ourselves, I'm not going to start with the Patria AMV, but rather what I consider the cream of the crop having been in operations in almost all Western IFVs on the market in Afghanistan. To the anger of many of my countrymen, I'm going to have to go with the excellent Swedish CV-90. The CV-90 has operated in about as many conflicts as the Bradley, and with that many operational hours, Heglunds have evolved it to become a formidable beast. It has been delivered to 10 European countries, and Heglunds have produced around 2,000 units. It is the most widely adopted European IFV, and it has been pushing technological advances in the IFV category for as long as I can remember. What makes the CV-90 stand out in comparison to its competitors is that it is a much more multi-role platform than in example the Bradley. There's anti-air variants, mortar variants, electronic warfare variants, and observation variants. Bullforce, who made the most effective anti-air gun in World War II, is the company behind the very capable 45mm turret. And the newest variant of the vehicle, the Mark IV, comes with augmented reality displays, which blend together data from other platforms in the network, and it was the first Western IFV to come with active protection against drones and incoming ordnance. Second on the list will have to be the 100% Polish-made Borsuk. For the first time in a long time, Poland has gone for a completely homemade variant to add to their impressive arsenal. It looks promising, and judging by how effective Polish artillery and APCs have been in Ukraine, there's absolutely no reason why this vehicle won't be as good or better than its competitors. What I would hope for Poland is that they did more like they have done with the Borsuk and Krab, rather than pouring billions of euros into US-made tanks. Poland has a very capable industry which just needs support to get off the ground in the tank space. Poland is focusing on setting up factories to build the capable South Korean K2, and with some localized Polish upgrades, this could be a very credible alternative to the US Abrams for them, at a fraction of the cost. What is a list about armored vehicles without a German variant, I hear you ask? Well, both the Lynx, Boxer and Puma from Germany's Rheinmetall and KMW respectively are all top-tier options. The Lynx has even excelled so well in trials that the US is considering it for its next IFV variant. The Lynx brings so-called flexible mission pods, which means that a unit can quickly swap out its armaments, ranging from airburst capability to anti-tank munitions. The Puma is somewhat older, but is a direct descendant of the Marder, 
currently causing havoc in Russian lines in Ukraine at the ripe old age of 40. And then there's the Dutch-German boxer, currently a mainstay of many European armed forces, which is a much more versatile chassis that you can use for many different roles, APCs, artillery and recovery. Say what you will about Germany, but their armored warfare heritage is unquestionable, as proven by the US and Soviet Union essentially doing everything in their power to secure German engineers post-World War II. Last but not least, France's very own futuristic take on a modern IFV, their newest VBCI Mark II. As with the more modern IFVs in this bracket, it comes with drone jamming, electronic warfare, and anti-drone capability through its anti-air targeting system. It is likely the cheaper of the bunch, but it remains to be seen if the pricing for it remains as low externally as it has internally for the French army. As for price, it is a bit like comparing apples and pears. Some of these systems are new, while some rely on the same older technology seen in the Bradley. The most expensive IFVs on the European list is the Lynx and Puma, which comes in at around 17 million euros for the Puma and 10 million for the Lynx, while the Borsuk and CV90 comes in at around 7 to 9 million. The French VBCI 2 is the cheapest of the bunch and only costs the French army around 3.5 million per unit. Generally, the price would be more expensive if France exported it abroad, but it is still cheaper than the rest on account of a slightly lighter digital suite than what we in example see in the CV90. The CV90 has a track record that few other variants besides the Boxer has in the European market space, and its successes in Ukraine have cemented its position as the go-to European IFV. Ideally, European nations should likely start considering if we take the best from each of these systems and pick two or three, rather than the seven to 10 systems currently being produced in the EU. French and German companies make four variants of IFVs alone. Three of them are made by KNDS, so it would probably be worth it for France and Germany to get together and decide on one common platform rather than Europe constantly using research and development funds on developing so many different systems. The story is fairly similar with APCs, as we've seen in Ukraine. The US-made striker has been a great vehicle for counterattacks and the push into Kursk. Europe doesn't lag behind here either and produces several variants that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the striker both on price and capability. Judging by the war in Ukraine, one European armored personnel carrier stands out the Polish-Finnish Rosomak APC. The Poles have taken the very capable Finnish Patria APC and made their own localized variant, which has been donated to Ukraine in large numbers. Of the 200 or so delivered vehicles to Ukraine, Oryx, who geotags and confirms equipment losses, have only managed to locate six destroyed Rosomaks, while one has been damaged and repaired. Compared to the US striker, where Ukraine has been confirmed to have lost somewhere between 35 to 40, this means that the Rosomak is roughly three times as durable. Now, the comments will probably be full of angry Americans saying that the striker is often used in the most hot areas of the front, but the Rosomak is placed with the infamous 21st, 57th and 44th Brigades. The 21st Brigade was as deeply involved in the push into Kursk as the striker brigades, so this isn't really an argument. At the risk of getting banished from Finland due to bragging about Finnish gear, I'm going to go out on a limb and put the equally successful Patria AMV, which the Rosomak APC is based on, in second place here. Finland has been very successful with their long heritage of APCs ever since its trusty Sisu APC made its debut in the middle of the Cold War. Finland has donated an unknown quantity of this vehicle series to Ukraine but my old colleagues in the Finnish army confirm that they've delivered several batches of 30 vehicles to Ukraine. So far, only five have been destroyed and five have been damaged or abandoned. It is deployed with the equally impressive 36th Marine Brigade who have been involved in Kursk and used the Sisu APC series to flank the Russian garrison in Vovshansk in 2024. The Patria and Sisu family has been widely exported and is currently in operation across 12 different nations, including a wide use in various UN-led peace missions. France also has a very capable APC named 
pardon my French, Véhicule de l'Avant Blandé, or VAB for short, which has also been donated in large numbers to Ukraine. Some sources in France say that at least 250 have been delivered. It has been lost to a somewhat higher degree than its Polish and Finnish counterparts, but it is worth noting that France has only sent older variants to Ukraine. The newest VAB is called Griffin and likely offers similar qualities to its biggest competitors. Ideally, France would send some of the Griffin to Ukraine for combat testing. This way, they'd get a baseline for how it fares against FPV drones and the dangers of modern combat. It is currently operated by at least 18 different nations, most of them being in Africa. As for pricing, the aforementioned systems range from 1 to 4 million euros, and as with the AFVs, the French solution is considerably cheaper than the rest, but this price is the internal price to the French army, and a likely export price would be higher. I elected not to mention the Boxer here, as we mentioned its IFV variant in the previous category, but the APC version would come in at around 5 million euros. Air defense is likely the item which the US has sold the most of to Europe, after HIMARS and F-35s in the last five or so years with the Patriot system being sold to Sweden, Germany, Greece, Netherlands, Poland, Romania, Spain, and Switzerland. In 2023 alone, a German-led coalition bought a package of missiles for these systems worth $5.5 billion, before you even consider the billions of dollars that these nations bought their launches for. The big issue for Europe is that they have only one credible long-range alternative to the Patriot, though there are promising projects taking place within the air defense space, which will likely become a credible long-range competitor within a few short years. Likely the European system which has seen the biggest success, as of late, is the Norwegian-made NASAMS. Kongsberg, who develops this system, is half-owned by the Norwegian state, and therefore it is a lot less affected by the whims of the market. NASAMS is the system which the US has deployed around the White House, and it has sold to a total of 12 current operators, as well as three future projects currently in the delivery phase. Kongsberg is working on a long-range variant that should increase its range from the medium space of 35 kilometers to well into the range of 50 to 70 kilometers. Second on the list, I'm going to put the French-Italian Samp T, likely the only European product who can compete on par with the Patriot. While the NASAMS operates American and Norwegian-made missiles, SAMP-T uses the purely made European Aster missiles in its operation. The new generation system currently being produced has a strike range of 150 km and a detection range of 350 km. Italy and France have each delivered at least one system to Ukraine, and reports coming back from Ukraine indicate that it works really well against anything that Russia throws at Ukraine, ballistic missiles included. Last in the European air defense space will have to be the German-made IRIS-T. As with the NASAMS, this system operates in the medium space, averaging from around 25 kilometers to the newest longer range 80 kilometers variant. While these ranges aren't massive, it has proven wildly successful at intercepting missiles in Ukraine. The missiles for this system is made in Sweden and Germany, and again relies almost exclusively on European parts. With the European air defense variants, the price varies based on range. The Ares, with the shortest range, is the cheapest, while the SAMP-T is half the price for a slightly longer range engagement zone compared to the Patriot. With this in mind, one has to question why so many European nations have gone for the US system, besides production capacity. With Trump acting like he is, there is absolutely no reason why European nations should pour billions into American R&D and air defense when we make similar, cheaper capability ourselves. The last weapons category I'm going to focus on in this video is missiles, where once again Europe creates valid alternatives to US variants. Sweden and Norway are two powerhouses in medium-range missile manufacture, with Sweden's RBS series offering up to 350 km range, while Norway's Joint Strike and Naval Strike variants offers 275 km sea skimming capability. The French, British and Italians make the Storm Shadow missiles, however these have several American components in them. The noise coming from France and Britain is that when America held back their deployment to Ukraine, it forced the producers to find credible Asian or European alternatives to these components, 
and that the missiles should become independent sometime during 2025. It has a range of 250 to 400 kilometers, but MDBA expects that this range is set to increase in this year. Lastly, the longest range European variant of non-nuclear missile is the German Taurus. It reaches 500 kilometers and Germany currently possesses a vast stockpile. Sadly, Germany's Olaf Scholz did not want to send them to Ukraine, and Germany have likely lost a lot of market credibility by holding them back. Sounds coming from the current leader of the opposition indicates that this will likely change if they win the election coming up. The war in Ukraine has proven to Europe that we need to focus on making our own independent missiles, and due to the issues surrounding the US holding back the storm shadow from deployment in Ukraine, France, Italy, Germany, Poland, Norway and Britain have come together to develop a new ground-based missile with a range of 1,000 to 2,000 kilometers. The program will be called ELSA, and it is this kind of attitude we need to see more of in Europe moving forward. I hope you enjoyed this second part of what I consider vital European options to American military technology. If you want me to make a third video on naval and logistical elements, let me know in the comments below. As always, have a wonderful weekend and let's make Europe great again.